Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this cotton tent remains burning rubber. And today, we are going to discuss cars. Yes, cars. I mean, I've talked about every other kind of vehicle, and I have gotten requests historically, actually months before, to talk about the worst cars ever. Which, sure, why not? Why the heck not? I mean, I drive a car. I can do basic maintenance on my car. I can change the oil and fix the brakes and do the wheels. I mean, I can talk about cars, okay? We can do that. But let's talk about five of the worst cars ever. Because this could be a really long list. There's a lot of bad cars. I'm just warning you now. The Nash Metropolitan. I had to weigh putting the Metropolitan on this list because in some ways it's really not that terrible, but it's full of so much stuff I can make fun of that I couldn't resist. There were several series built between 1954 and 1962, and they were marketed as a small economy car, a second car for families. And in particular, they wanted to market the car towards women. It's actually notable as being one of the first cars to be marketed in that way, being advertised as a motorized shopping cart for affluent urban girls, which... <laughs> oh my goodness, I hope Twitter never gets a hold of such a slogan. That is so, so dated in so many ways. Oh, 1950s never change, wow! As such, it is a rather cute car, and in fact, I have nothing negative to say about it aesthetically, to be honest, because, frankly, no matter how I look at it, I'm like, nah, that's really adorable. That's the cutest car I've seen in my life. But from a performance perspective, both financially and mechanically, well, it really seems to depend what series you're talking about and who you ask. Because some people felt they could handle pretty well, and they were fairly reliable, but it seems to be like it's a very mixed bag, because other sources say, no, 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 their handling sucked, and they weren't very reliable. But I guess it would depend how much you drove them. After all, they were meant to be a small economy car. But that market just didn't seem to exist back then. I mean, through surveys, Nash showed that, yeah, there should be a market for this type of car, but it just didn't sell. Not really at all. It was a financial disaster, to be brutally honest with many people these days calling it one of the worst cars ever, just like I am. But in the modern day, it's actually gained a bit of a cult following. There's a small but pretty enthusiastic fan base in North America and Europe that maintains surviving examples of these vehicles. And their price on the collector's market has actually been going up over the years. And I guess I can understand the appeal because, you know, whether or not they were good or bad or whether they sold well, because they didn't, they are really adorable but I can't get over that marketing. A motorized shopping cart? Really? Really? Yo! The Renault Dauphine, which is French, and I looked at the pronunciation again, and that's what they said, so nobody better correct me in the comments, because I checked this time, to make sure that I was saying this French word right. Also, no, no, not aesthetically pleased this time, not gonna lie. It's just something about those headlights. They're, they're put in such a weird place for me. I, I can't get behind this vehicle. Maybe because it's European. Maybe if you're French or British or any European, maybe you think this looks fine. But to an American, no. We need our cars manly, beefy with giant tires. Hurling horrific black smoke into the clouds. America! Anyway, much like the Metropolitan, the Dauphine was designed to be an economical car. And truth be told, for the European market, the Dauphine actually did very well. Over there, it was absolutely fine. It was only when they attempted to bring it over to America that they suffered from serious issues and many of their flaws started being revealed. See, the car was designed for French driving conditions, which are much more localized city driving. 
short distances, lower speeds. It's very nimble and easy to work with under those conditions. But the United States just finished construction of an interstate highway system. Under those conditions, the Renault just could not handle it. They were very vulnerable to corrosion for one. And under long distance driving, they just failed all the time. Their reliability took a significant hit. But the biggest issue was their acceleration. This is where the highway driving comes in. As you may know, highway driving is usually at minimum 55 miles per hour. The Renault could get up to that speed, but it took 32 seconds, over half a minute, to accelerate from 0 to 60 miles per hour, or 97 kilometers an hour. That is horrible. Writer Dan Neal once pointed out that the acceleration put the Dauphine at a severe disadvantage in any drag race involving farm equipment. That's how slow they were. Renault had completely failed to notice that the market in America was changing when it came to what kind of cars we needed to drive. And as a result, the Dauphine was a financial disaster for them. It was awful. Perhaps fundamentally, and in terms of inner city driving, you could do worse than the Dauphine. But with the new highway system back then, they just didn't cut it at all. The Hillman Imp. Built between 1963 and 1976, the Hillman Imp is actually considered largely responsible for the parent company, Roots Group, getting into financial trouble and then being taken over by Chrysler. It's yet another small economy car that was built to compete with BMC's very popular mini car. It actually received acclaim at first, as it had a very modern design, in some ways very ahead of its time, good handling, and actually decent luggage space, despite being a rather small vehicle. But it was criticized for having a rear engine, as well as a rear wheel drive layout, while the Mini had a front engine and a front wheel drive layout. That wasn't the major issue though, as it could be worked around, it wasn't like the worst thing in the world. No, the thing that really sealed the deal for the imps was quality control. There was a new purpose-built Linwood plant specifically to manufacture these cars. But the imps overall design was somewhat rushed into production, and quality issues of the new plant caused incredibly common gearbox and water pump failures. Plus they had poor engine cooling, and that caused their motors to overheat. Still, they had some limited success as rally cars, and had their uses if you weren't going too far. But again, in the grand scheme of things, they completely underperformed. And it's a little hard to argue when they are largely responsible for destroying the company that made them. The Ford Pinto. I almost didn't put the Pinto on this list at all, because, frankly, if you're into cars, particularly bad ones, you already know this story. But if I didn't talk about it, I'd have 87 million comments about not including it. So here we are. The Ford Pinto was manufactured between 1971 and 1980. They sold really well, and fundamentally, from an overall performance perspective, they're not that bad. They're actually quite good. They're totally fine vehicles. It's a matter of safety when it comes to the Pinto. When they were still in the design phase, Ford had a problem designing the Pinto's fuel system because of the uncertain regulatory environment during that period. The first federal standard for automotive fuel system safety, which was passed in 1967, known as Section 301 in the Federal Motor Safety Standards, originally only covered front and impacts. But in 1963, which was 18 months into the development cycle for the Pinto, they proposed expanding the standard to also cover rear-end collisions. This proposed standard was based on a 20 mile per hour moving barrier rear impact test. Ford actually announced its support for this standard. But in August of 1970, which was the month the Pinto went into production, the NHTSA changed the proposal to a more stringent 20 mile per hour fixed barrier standard which is a lot different, and car companies were to meet this within 18 months. Ford and other automobile manufacturers actually objected to this standard. But in terms of how this really affects the Pinto, 
The design of the car positioned its fuel tank between the solid live rear axle and the rear bumper. This was actually standard practice in US subcompact cars at that time. What was a bit more unique about the Pinto though is that it had a reduced rear crush space, namely a part of the car that's supposed to crush to absorb an impact, as well as a lack of structural reinforcement in the rear. All this coupled with a rear bumper that was considered largely ornamental, though again, not that dissimilar from other manufacturers of the time. They did conduct internal crash tests to determine the potential of a problem when it came to the Pinto, and it was found with a few of them that there was a chance that an impact from the rear could puncture the fuel tank and cause the car to burst into flame, which would be bad. They still released the car anyway, as repositioning the fuel tank was not considered a viable option for the hatchback-style car. But beginning in 1973, field reports of Ford Pintos that were consumed by fire after low-speed rear-end collisions started being received by Ford's recall coordinator office. There was an internal memo discovered at Ford that basically weighed the cost between issuing a full recall to actually, you know, fix the problem, or just allowing the problem to continue and paying out costs for injuries and deaths relating to accidents specifically associated with this fire issue. It was discovered by Ford, as far as they were concerned, that it'd be cheaper to let the Pintos go and not issue a recall. When this was discovered, oh, oh no, there were multiple legal cases surrounding this, and Ford wound up paying out way, way more than they ever would have had to had they just been honest in the first place and recalled the stupid cars. When you're designing a vehicle, especially for public use, you are morally and legally obligated to ensure that product is safe. Ford had not done this, and it wasn't even a matter of ignorance. They knew that this could happen. They literally calculated how much it would cost to leave it alone and deliberately chose to let people catch fire and just pay out costs related to that rather than actually recall the stupid vehicles. As a result of all this, the Pinto has long been painted as one of the worst cars in history. And it's kind of hard to argue around it when, yeah, if you get hit in the rear in a Pinto, there is a chance the fuel will combust and the car will catch fire. And that would be bad. Now, in fairness, like I started this section with, from a mechanics perspective, in terms of reliability, in terms of maneuverability, top speed, acceleration, all that, the Pintos were actually all right. But uh, it's really hard to argue around the whole fire thing, that's what I'm trying to say. The Oldsmobile diesel engines produced between 1978 and 1985. I admit that I'm kind of cheating. Because the number one pick for worst car ever isn't actually a specific car, it's many. But they all use the same kind of engines. Namely, the diesel engines that were produced by Oldsmobile under General Motors between 1978 and 1985. During that time, they produced three of them. Two of them were V8s and one was a V6. The engines were put into actually a ton of different vehicles. From Centuries to DeVilles to Caprice, Caballeros, you name it. But they all had the same problem, because of the engines they were using. Now, why would you want to put a diesel engine in a regular car? Well, it's not unheard of, for one thing. And for reference, these particular engines were manufactured and put into vehicles specifically in response to the 1970s oil crisis. Gasoline was becoming actually hard to come by and expensive, but diesel fuel was a bit more readily available. So General Motors thought it made sense to give consumers the option of switching over to diesel fuel so they could drive their cars. Which, okay, totally fine. That's a great idea. Problem. They totally rushed the designs of these diesel engines. In fact, calling them diesel engines is debatable, because when Oldsmobile was designing them, they left the head bolt design and pattern unchanged on purpose to enable them to use the same tooling as for gasoline engines. This isn't normal. Diesel and gasoline engines work very differently. They're both internal combustion based, yes, but diesel fuel has a much, much higher flash point than gasoline does. 
and the power output that a diesel engine gives is a lot different. The head bolt design needs to be able to withstand that, especially when you consider that diesel engines have compression ratios that can be as much as three times higher than a typical gasoline engine. But they left it the same, and the result was catastrophic, horrific head bolt failures all over the place. Any number of these engines would have suffered this exact fault, and that wasn't the only issue. General Motors decided not to install water separators in these engines in order to cut costs on them, because of course they did. Now that doesn't necessarily sound like a requirement, because as long as the diesel fuel is good, it shouldn't need a water separator. But low quality diesel fuel was extremely common at that time and the vast majority of actually well-made diesel engines were equipped with these separators specifically to keep the injector pumps from corroding, but Oldsmobiles weren't. The engines were terrible, and they knew it before they even launched them. One of their engineers who had worked on the project begged his bosses not to release the engines, because they just weren't ready. They weren't gonna work. General Motors doing exactly what I would personally expect from them in a situation like this, took a long look at their cherished history, their responsibility to their consumers, and promptly forced that engineer into early retirement and released the engines anyway. As a result, so many cars suffered these exact failures that I've listed, and they were problems that were never really resolved until nearly a decade after the fact. And unlike a lot of the previous cars I've mentioned on this list, these vehicles aren't even high-value targets on the collector's market anymore because those engines are such trash. A large number of them actually had their broken diesel engines replaced with conventional gasoline engines later. That is, assuming that their owners were rich enough to invest that kind of money in an older model car, or just buy a new one. I mean, that was the whole point. I don't know. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Some Dude 267, Orange Glass, Joshua Long, Ohio Trucker 1, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hawk 444, Arthur Roy, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitson 131-232, Mr. Black Rose Tribal Typhoon, Master of None, Josh Johnson, Block Kraken, Twin Fox, Dime Blade 17, and Anzac A1. Till next time. This is Darkness, and every dwell a fond farewell.